Hello, I'm Dapper Dan Gavostin, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which I say definitely count. Welcome to the Amazing Spider Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. Thanks for joining us for a special Amazing Friends episode of the Amazing Spider Talk. If you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present, and future, subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app and leave us a review to help spread the word about our show. This podcast exists because of the support of our Patreon members. If you want to receive early episodes, exclusive artwork, and keep this podcast going, go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and consider joining our Patreon. Today on the show, we're fortunate to be joined by Cody Ziegler, writer of the current ongoing Miles Morales Spider-Man series, which just celebrated its 300th issue. He wrote for Amazing Spider-Man during the recent Beyond era as part of the rotating team of writers. Additionally, he wrote the Spider-Punk miniseries and is continuing that legacy with his new Spider-Punk Arms Race miniseries. Cody has brought a fresh voice to the Miles Morales comics, which Mark and I have been praising in our Substack at AmazingSpider.Substack.com. Mark was unable to be present for this interview, so I was thrilled to sit down with Cody myself to learn more about his process, how he joined Marvel, and a few other surprises he shared along the way. We hope you enjoy the interview. Well, now let's meet one of our amazing spider friends, the kind of guy who to other friends who recommend. Find out about the things they created. You'll love them so much that you wish you dated. But you're just friends. They're an amazing friend. A friend, a friend, a friend. They're an amazing friend. All right. Uh, welcome to the show, Amazing Spider Talk, Cody Ziegler. Hey, how's it going, man? Thanks for having me. Nice seeing I'm you again. S- I'm so thrilled to have you. Well, Cody's saying, nice to see you again. We actually bumped into each other. Um, I say bumped, but I was headed there like a guided missile uh, <laughs> to talk to Cody. Um, at one of my favorite local, uh, local to the Valley here in L.A., comic book stores, Galaxy of Comics, uh, mm-hmm. you were doing a signing there for... Um, I don't think Miles 300 was out yet. It was the debut of the the new Spider Punk Arms Race number yes, one. Is that what yes. it was about? Yeah, yeah, that was a big thing. Yeah, um, I, I saw a shop I've never been to before, but one of my one of the coolest shops I've been into. Like they had, um, you know, obviously toys and stuff, but also they had like full stand up arcade machines, which I haven't seen in a shop in a long time. So like, I get why it's your go to shop. That place has got a cool cool vibe going on. It's one of those rare shops that does really well for new books. It's got a great selection of old books if you want to go mm-hmm. bin diving. And then yeah. they have this entire wing of the store dedicated to kids stuff. Yeah, that's um, cool. Which, like, I really appreciate because someone's got to get kids into comics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, you know, speaking of getting into comics, uh, for many of our listeners, uh, you first arrived on their radar during the beyond era of Amazing Spider-Man. Mm. Um, but I'm curious, you know, like whatever our history is, what's your <laughs> history with the wall crawler? Uh, when, when did you beca- first become a fan of Marvel and Spider-Man? You know, it's weird. I mean, I feel like it's, it's like one of those things that's always just existed as a kid. Like, In the you womb? Know, I th- yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like I watched the, I mean, I definitely watched the TV shows. Like I played the games and stuff and like, I was a big um, Marvel versus Capcom fan. So like I was always picking Spidey and doing like, you know, his 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 specials and like the web throws and stuff. So like he's always just existed. Um, I don't think I actually read Spider Man proper until I was in maybe college, like college aged. I um, got into Ultimate Line. Like that's how I first got into like Cape stuff proper. And how I got into Marvel stuff was like I was an ultimate. The Ultimate Universe was made for me. Like knew who the characters are, but like didn't know the backstory. So like I read Ultimate Spider Man. Ultimate X Men, Ultimate Fantastic Four, ult- yeah. Ultimate Power, the Ultimates. Like I literally ran through the entire Ultimate line up until, um, up until like ult- Ultimate Ultimatum, which, which everyone were they killed everyone. So that's when I kind of stopped. Ultimatum, yeah, yeah. yeah that's it was I a I good kinda, jumping off point. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a really cool time. So like I got into it there. Like I read with Peter for like the first hundred however many issues until he like you know died and then miles took over so like i was i was there for like 10 years or whatever so like that's how i got into the spider-man proper and um how i got into like the actual comics is you know i was writing on she hulk and zeb wells who as you know writes amazing spider-man and writes a, a ton of comics he was like sort of the second in command there and at the time he was working on this ant-man like 
mini series, and I just remember yeah, looking it's at great. him. Looking, yeah, it was a crazy. I've never, I, I didn't, I've never seen comics be made. So like, he looking at these crazy art, this crazy artwork of like, you know, twenty story bugs fighting like Ant Man. I'm like, what is this? He's like, oh, this is a comic. I'm like, how do you get into it? He's like, well. Let me see how your script turns out um, for this, and then if it's if I think it like works, I can introduce you to some people. And he liked it, and he introduced me to Nick Lowe. And Nick was like, "Hey, what are you into?" I was like, "Spider Man, particularly like Black Spider Man." And like, I only read the Ultimate line. He's like, "Well, that's great because I edited most of the Ultimate line, so it seems like we have sort of similar sensibilities." And like from that, he my first ever comic book I ever wrote was a uh, ten page backup for Miles Morales twenty five like a 10 pager thing. Like I introduced Bumbler. Like that was my big, that was like my big thing. In the, my big um, introduction to Marvel was introducing a very dumb throwaway character that now for somehow I can't shake him off. So like that, that really how it started was like Zeb Wells just took a shot on me. And like, now I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Well, that's so funny because like normally you have to kind of like work your way up the ranks through like C and D list characters on mini series yeah. and things like that. And you're just like, he's like, Hey, what are you interested in? Normally you're like uh moon Knight or like sleepwalker. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, uh, well, what about number one? What about Spider-Man? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's, yeah, he's just, like, well, let's I, just shoot sure, our guess. shot. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, closed mouths don't get fed. So like, that was the big thing is I, I did miles. And then I had to do like my first like book proper was a, it was a terrible one shot. I mean, terrible on my part. The art was great, but it was, um, I think it was heroes were born was like this event they were doing. And I wrote like a squadron Supreme one shot where like, sure. Um, like the, the B and speaking of D list, like the D and C list of the squadron Supreme. So like, you know, Q and V list and, and, and in actuality that were fighting like Baron Zemo and his team of like, um, Thunderbolts or whatever. And I remember being terrified because it had to be 30 pages and I had only written 10 pages before and I had no idea how to like cram struck. I was just like a, a nervous wreck. But after They're that, like, I got g- back. Give him the DC spin uh, spoof characters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I was like, oh, f- here we go. Uh, I hope it, <laughs> hope it turns out well. Well, so, you know, I'm really interested in this because you're a creator who belongs in a new type of pipeline into comics, which is television. It mm-hmm. used to kind of be the other way around that comic writers would use their credentials from comics to yeah. hopefully write for TV because that was like the lucrative place to be. But um, yeah, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to kind of have flipped. I've heard rumors that comics work is actually more stable than television work, especially with the pandemic and the writer's yeah. strike. Um, can, can you speak to coming in through television um, and, you know, maybe other people, you know, uh, you know, bucking this trend in comics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I can only peak, speak from my perspective, but yeah, you know, the end game for me was always writing um, for Marvel Studios, and like one day I would love to write comics. I was always talking about how I'd love to write comics, even in the She Hulk room. And, um, you know, I, I I was lucky in that like the first job I ever got basically was Marvel Studios. So I was like, oh shit, now, now what do I do? And like my first comic thing was Marvel Comics. So, like, I think from my perspective, like, you know, it, it definitely. It, it's definitely easier, I think, in my experiences to go from TV to comics if you have written for, like, a bigger property. Like, definitely it's much easier to go from, you know, She-Hulk and be like, oh, this is co-signed by Kevin Feige. Like, Kevin Feige has read my mm-hmm. writing and he likes my writing. So, like, it's easier. It was I found it much easier to be able to go from that to, like, writing Spider-Man as opposed to, like, oh, I, I'm writing Spider-Man into writing for, like, you know, Miss Marvel or whatever. I think that's just sort of how it sort of worked out. And, like... Even from our generation and my generation, I'm, I mean, like those um, sort of new writers that came up when um, DC or when Disney Plus was doing that big sort of push for 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 TV shows and movies and stuff. Like, you know, Loveness, Jeff Loveness, um, Zeb Wells, obviously Sabir, who was on Miss Marvel, now is writing Miss Marvel with Amon, Miss Marvel, um, myself. Um, there's another lady in our room named Dana Schwartz. Um, Celeste, uh, um, uh, Celeste, who is Brothman. writing, um, yeah. Brothman, who is writing. Um, um jackpot series and black hat um like all marvel people um or marvel adjacent like um so like uh, that definitely was like that's been my experience is like it's definitely easier to break in um and it pays obviously much better in like the healthcare and residuals and like all that sort of stuff that you get from having a unit is helpful um when it comes to stability like yeah you know comics is more stable you know, you know, you're going to hopefully you'll probably have a book every month that goes out. Yeah. Um, and it definitely helped when when we were on strike last year. Like, you know, if you notice that I have so many books coming out now, it's because last year I agreed to do a bunch of books because I didn't know when I was going to work again. So, like, that's why you have like that's when you, when you have free time to write uh, um, 
an ongoing for Miles and an ongoing for Deadpool and a graphic novel and a, and a Spider Punk too. Um, um, I think from my perspective, like it, it, for me, it, because my day job is television writing, um, I sort of view comic book writing as a hobby that, you know, it pays, which is really nice. But like, I also find myself not necessarily as stressed out as probably some other um, writers that were probably at, at my caliber or, or my, not my, my caliber, like my, my sort of, um, I guess, class is that like, if I know that um, my day job is a, is a union TV show, like I don't have to worry necessarily about, you know, fighting back with like my editors. Like I can just have a sort of confidence in the going into that. Like I deal with, I know how it's like dealing with like notes from like an executive who are, they can be brutal and like yeah. dealing with the comic book editor in my experience is like such a completely different. And like, there's so much nicer than, than like TV notes. And, and also I think um, because I've been lucky enough to work on bigger shows and shows that are like, you know, um, part of the culture and, and the zeitgeist and, well respected for for better or for worse um i think that also has instilled a sort of like um confidence that they may have in me like i think if you see that oh you know he's written for like marvel and like he's written for rick and morty or, or futurama or, or whatever like we have we think that he can probably curate like a 20 page comic book story um i think also because of that like i may have a little bit thicker skin when it comes to like criticism and like ignoring um ignoring like i i don't i don't read reviews uh very rarely rare for me to read reviews like i would hardly ever go on twitter and like look up my name or like if someone tagged me like i would i would never I, it's very rare for me to flip that coin and see what they're saying it was something good or something bad but like i think when you when you make something like and, and you know that you know millions of people have watched it and they all have opinions on it <laughs> i think uh i think when you when you're when you have a skin that's tough enough to deal with that like like I think you probably for me anyway, like I don't get as um I don't take it um as personal if like someone doesn't like a character or like if someone has beef with Miles or whatever, like I don't care as much because you know, I I'm I I've been through the fires. Like, you know, it's like what's that, that line from Blade Runner? Like attack ships on I've seen things you people wouldn't uh, couldn't believe, you know? Uh, like, attack ships <laughs> off the Orion yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you know. I, I'm I'm so curious that you're saying this because, like, um, you know, I I exist in both worlds. I uh, was a film critic for a long time, yeah. and mm -hmm. I consider myself a comics critic, even though I'm not appointed by anyone to that position. Like I yeah. was a film critic, um, but like I find that like comics readers and and some of them not, aren't readers, but still have a very strong opinion. T yeah. Tend to be even more opinionated and. Uh, vociferous about that opinion than uh, people in television and, and film are is, mm -hmm. as someone on the receiving end of that, you say you don't look, but clearly you must have some kind of like a uh, uh, way to read the temperature of it. Do, do you find that accurate? Like the comics people are very passionate about what they comment on. Um, yeah. Or, or it's, no? it's, yeah. It's, it's such a different thing. It's, I feel like comic book reading at least, for the majority, and again, I don't have any science for this. Like it seems, it's so much more um, active, I think, than watching a film or, mm -hmm. or or TV show. Like I think it's really sort of maybe it's sort of in the same sphere as as video game, where it's it's not as passive because if you're a comic book fan, like you know you you have a local shop that you go to, you get in your car, you take the bus, or you ride your bike, or you walk, or whatever, you go there. Like you maybe you have a pool list, so like you. You've told some employee there to like physically set up, set aside yeah. X number of comics in your own little box. You take it. You, if you're really into it, like you make, you're looking through it to make sure like the cover is the same quality as, as pretty. Like there's so much more that goes into it um, than I think. You know, just downloading an app and watching on your iPad or or, or whatever. You know, and um, I think also like I've been thinking about this lately as I've been going to more cons and stuff. Like I feel like conventions are like sort of like the sort of last bastion of like at least in american culture where like you can go to a place and like actively support art like it's the only place i can see where you go and you're like oh there are people here that are going to give a literal artist money to like make art like it's like people taking commissions or like if you're like you know making t-shirts or whatever like it's one of those it's one of the few places i think where you actually sort of see a group, large groups of people like supporting directly artists, which I think is interesting. But yeah, you it's know, like also at any moment, a bartering system might break out. Yeah, truly. It's like, hey, I had this number one. Will you trade me this? You know, yeah. it's it's so interesting. And it's cool seeing like uh, uh, art be supported in that way. Um, but that's my long winded way of, of building up to, 
yeah, I think comic book fans because of that are um, more engaged and like also there's this unique cross section where like like you said like you may not even read comics you may just like collect because you like the art or whatever so like you know it, it's one of those things where people will come up and be like hey i love this cover i haven't read the story but like i love these covers and i've collected like three four five six different variant covers of like a one thing of a comic that they may not even read or like there are some people that come up and be like hey um what's uh, no one's ever said anything like really rude to me it's always been like um hey uh make don't don't basically don't fuck up miles or like, Hey, can you bring this character back? Nothing. No one's ever been rude to, 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 uh, to me in my face. But like, you know, I've, I've had other comic f- 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 creators who uh, have had fans, like not intentionally, oh. but like, you know, you know, you're a little socially awkward or like you're meeting someone, like they say things that backhandedly can be very insulting and like, you know, they take it on the chin, but it is, it is funny watching someone get insulted to their face and like watching them sort of choke it down and be like, yeah, you know, maybe next time, maybe the next arc will be better. Like, I personally haven't had that happen, and I knock on wood, it, it doesn't happen. But um, I think also, I also came up doing comedy, so like, you know, bombing on stage is like the worst feeling on the planet. So like, sure, I always like I, I people not liking a thing and telling me in person isn't. It isn't as bad when it's a whole group of like 200 people silent in an audience be like, you know what, this isn't funny. So like, I think also I've sort of had an armor built up that way. Well, comics used to also have this kind of like protective barrier around it that was like the letters mm-hmm. page. And mm-hmm. now like on Twitter and social media, yeah. like, you you can get directly, you know, uh, in the face. And like I look at someone like Dan Slott, who was kind of the yeah. first like big guy, like killing Spider-Man off in the age of Twitter. You know, yeah. um, was yeah. you know, uh, sparked a huge backlash, and I've long joked that the like the fastest way to create fifty thousand enemies is to be the lead writer of Amazing Spider Man, <laughs> and uh, you know I think Zeb is probably going through it right now himself. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it was uh, funny watching. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. No, it, it was funny watching when the whole Kamala stuff was going down, and like he he had told me like you know months before the the plan, which is like you know came like Feige was like hey um I don't do this very often but like can you please just like do this to like make things in line with with Marvel because we have some stuff we want to do with Kamala so he's like F- I'm the guy that drew the short short, short straw people are going to be <laughs> very mad that I have to kill Miss Marvel but he was it like it definitely it's... felt like he drew the short straw and not like yeah. that was his intention yeah yeah and, and, and it's, it's sort of I felt bad for him because people didn't know that like this you, you know, she's gonna quote unquote die as comic book she comes back of course but like you don't realize that like when she dies and comes back like the miss marvel is going to be like writing her so like remember when he told me that's like oh that's so cool people are going to like lose their minds well they're gonna lose their mind because she's died but also i think people are going to like really be excited that like you know for the first time that like you know uh, an mcu actor is like going to be actively participating in like creating like the lore of the character and like comic books proper which is like you know sometimes they'll like write short stories but like having actively engaged in like a run or like a miniseries is a pretty big deal and like you know Amon is like an enormous comic book fan which I think anyone knows who who follows her or her sure. knows anything about her lore but like she's genuinely an enormous comic book fan so like I was like yeah it sucks for you I'm glad that I don't have to do that but um it, it, it was fun why it was funny like watching him get savaged online knowing that he's sort of the guy that had to like answer the call of, of daddy Feige to, to to make this to make this sacrificial play. I don't think they did him any favors I mean they yeah. like teased it was going to be MJ for a long time like I mean that was yeah. poking the bear of all bears so um yeah. speaking of amazing spider-man um you first entered, you know, the world of Spider-Man, you know, proper through mm-hmm. in in the Beyond era of uh, of Amazing Spider-Man. You know, mm-hmm. can you tell us about how this came about? I know Zeb invited you into the fold, but yeah. um, can you tell us more about like that call and like what was communicated to you? Yeah, so like you know, like, like I said at the beginning, Zeb and I had worked together on She-Hulk, and Zeb is a TV guy. He had written for robot chicken forever he had his own show super mansion for like three or four seasons like he's a guy that's been around the way and um you know we would always talk about how um we love the collaborative effort of of the feeling of like a writer's room he's like we don't really see that for comics like we have like these retreats where like you know we'll talk about big picture stuff but like never in like the nitty-gritty of it he's like i i would really like to try that for like uh, like uh uh, basically an arc for like a comic book series so like he basically just like got together all of some of his favorite writers, like Saladin and Kelly and 
and and and myself and um and Patrick and um he was like, "Hey, uh, this is what we're going to do like this sort of the overarching narrative like a TV room like where we're going to get to it um and uh but unlike TV like I'm not going to like rewrite you guys like that's 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 like sacrilege to do in comics like if another writer rewrites someone like it's like it's 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 not a thing that people do in comics um so like you guys basically have carte blanche but like here's just basically like a loose idea where we want to go and like if you can hit these beats in this issue or he'd be like hey um it'd be cool to have like a therapy scene in this issue kelly can you do that so like really really small things like that but really we'd hop on a zoom for like you know two or three hours maybe once every other month and just like talk through what we're going to do and like you know pick what characters we wanted to pick and like i was like the i was like the the one wettest behind the years like i'd written like you know, two backups and like one terrible one shot on my part. So like, I was like, I'm just happy to be here. So, you know, they were like, yeah, you know, what do you think about Craven? I was like, I love Craven. I'll do anything with Craven. And meanwhile, I'm like, nah, I got no take on Craven. Like he's fine. But like, I just know that he was like an angry Russian guy that hunts, hunts Spider-Man. So like, I was just sort of happy to be there. And like, I think because of that, um, I was, so given... th- was, was that how this was disseminated? Like you kind of just like drew, not drew straws, but like stood up or raised your hand for the one you wanted. Yeah, so like Solomon was like, well, since I'm Solomon was writing Miles at the time, so he's like, yeah, like it would. There's not a world like there's no reality in which like there's going to be a new quote unquote Spider Man that would interact with like the other Spider Man. So he's like, yeah, Ben Riley, who becomes like the um, I guess the Manhattan Spider Man is how we sort of breaking it down. Like he's he becomes like you know the red and blue Spider Man, and Miles is black and black and red Spider Man. So he's like, yeah, they should interact. So like since I'm writing Miles, like I'll write that or like. Kelly was like, yeah, I want to, like, I like Misty Knight and, and Colleen. Like, I want to do something with Daughters of the Dragon. So they, you know, put them together. And I was like, they gave me, they gave me Craven. They gave me a list of people. I was like, oh, I can, I can do, I can, I can find an angle with Craven, which was like, um, you know, I had two issues and like the whole premise is that like this big corporation back Spider-Man, blah, 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 blah. I was like, I could see a guy like Craven, like being sort of irked that, like the purity of the hunt is, um is being messed up by this um this 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 big organization and um then they offered me like a a doctor octopus thing I was like yeah that'd be I would always want to write him he's fun he's a goofy guy like it's something it's very rare to write like one of the quintessential like Spider-Man rogues so like they offered me that and and, and they're like we have room for like one like sort of like um standalone thing with like him and Aunt May do you have a take on that it's like yeah it'd be fun to write like a uh, detective thing with them where they're like disgustingly horny for one another and like uh, the, the, that was like my main thing and like we would pitch stuff every every now and then but truly the big the, the coolest thing is that like when you have your script done you're like man I don't know if this is working or not like you could send it into like the slack and have like f-ing Kelly Thompson or Zeb Wells or so whoever like read your comic and be like hey this is working this isn't working so like for me it was it was cool just having like a team of like some of the best writers in the game and some of my favorite writers. Like I cannot sing the praises of Kelly Thompson's black widow enough. Like it's one of the absolute best runs of any comic book, but particularly black widow. Like it's like her, her, it's just really, really, really well made. And I can't express that enough. So like, yeah, no, I, that, I love her captain Marvel too. It's really wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's one of the best writers out there in the game. So let me ask you about this. You know, I, I love the writer's room. Um, uh, kind of concept for Amazing Spider-Man, mm-hmm. especially if it's going to be twice a month or three times a month. And I, I don't know what your history with the title is. Um, like, you know, all the way back in the brand new day era, they they sampled that. And, and was, Zeb was one of the original people um, who worked during that era with the mm-hmm. th- thrice monthly book and, yeah. you know, about five or six different writers. Um, but like, I do think that it requires kind of like a, a steady... Uh, hand from an editor to kind of keep everything feeling like it fits together, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and stuff like that. I mean, uh, did you guys like talk about the kind of overall arc uh, of it and tonally how things fit, um, you know, in in there? And this is not offered as a critique in any way. I'm just genuinely Mm -hmm. curious about like how hands on editorial was and like what role they played in helping you guys who I imagine like this 19 part thing, it can be yeah. sometimes hard to see the forest for the trees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, again, this is for my, since I was like the newest one there, like I'm sure they didn't hold, they may have, I didn't have the much contact with them outside of like the Zacks and like, or Slacks and like emails or texts to Nick. But like, because basically it was like Zeb, um, we knew Zeb was going to be taking over Amazing Spider-Man after that. So like, 
it was more like a way for him to like sort of like clear some runway for him and like get like have a fun arc and then like sort of land into like his new run so like it'd be like you know we have like a giant google doc with like everything that's happening and every single issue like major beats that need to happen like through lines um and like sort of like ideas and stuff so like that would be checked we could always check that or like if um you know if you reference something in an issue you would get like an email from from nick or a text me like hey um this actually is going to be happening in another issue or like this character is popping up over here blah 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 like there's sort of that like minutia that you get with editors is like um that i really appreciate is that like oh uh i don't know what's going on i don't know what well, i don't know what the status quo is for this character because i didn't know they've been appearing in like 15 other books since then so like that was really helpful but um for the actual like structure and through line a lot of it was like just in a dock and then also zeb was spearheading that so like you could for me i mean because we're friends like i could get a text from him like hey can you massage this a little bit or can you put these like here's some like areas i would need for a line to help me set up for this issue could you put this in there and you know because i come from tv i was like yeah of, of course like you know a rising sure. tide lifts all ships so like i'm i'm used to that and also it's nice that I get to do the rewrites where usually like, you know, you're past your script off to your showrunner and then like you're sort of done with it. So like, um, like I said, Zeb made a point to be like, yeah, I'm never going to rewrite anyone um, because like, that's just not what you do in comics. And also these are my suggestions. Take them if you want to, but it would help the overall narrative if we could get sort of get to this place. So uh, like, you know, in terms of like timeline, you know, you, mm -hmm. you came on, you know, in the beyond era kind of came in and again, I don't really know your history with amazing Spider-Man, but like mm -hmm. the Nick Spencer run had been going on for a long time. And, you know, I, I, this is speculation, but like the end of it seemed to kind of, I, I don't know if the, if fall apart is really the right way to say it, but mm -hmm. like, it didn't really seem like, like a, like a prop, like proper ending and, and, I've heard rumors about him leaving to go to Substack and hmm. kind of leaving the office in a bit of a lurch. And I, yeah. I'm not asking you to comment on that at all. But like when you came onto the book, what do is there any idea of like you said that it was like building the runway for um, Zed to take over? You know, did did you have an idea of like what kind of role you guys were playing in that transition between? Uh, creative teams because normally you just go from one creative team to another mm. this seemed to be an unusual circumstance that we would yeah. get this kind of not even peter parker focused uh, uh book you know one that mm -hmm. brought in ben riley someone you know you could kind of leave peter out of it so to speak yeah no um i didn't have a big i didn't have much information for that but my sense was that um also it's like my first time writing for like a big book you know, like i'd say sure. i only done like Two backups in a in a um, one shot. So, um, yeah, the don't ask I questions. Got, just go right. Yeah, yeah, truly. But, yeah. but my 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 take my sort of take that I got was that like, um, if you told me that wasn't normal for comics, I I wouldn't know because I, I didn't know. But like my my take was that, um, Zeb was going to be taken over, and he was going to have the big thing was going to be like this sort of mystery. Um, like the where was Peter? I think was like what they were sort of saying in like the sure the right. What, what did Peter whatever. do? Yeah. yeah, what did Peter do? So, I think they also wanted to do. I think they also wanted to like shift the status quo for Ben for Riley Ben Riley, um, and that's I think that's where they also the pitch for the name Chasm came from, and like where where that all that sort of mo there's a motif in the in those nineteen issues of like him missing a face whether it's like sure. a flashback with his 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 um uncle uncle ben or himself or i guess his biological uncle peter's i guess uncle in the in the time that it happened if you're a clone he, is it still biological yeah, uh, yeah who knows questions yeah. to ask yeah um but no like i yeah my my takeaway my my sort of take that i got away was that like let's since we're gonna have the switch up between artists or between writers i guess like it'd be fun to just have this sort of like sort of self-contained arc in spider-man which is like it's not it's not peter so it, it's been but also it was a way to get a bunch of people that haven't sort of dipped their toes into spider-man and i think for me if i had to guess it was a way for marvel to be like all right can this guy write like a, a full issue of like a spider person mm -hmm. um because i went from that to spider punk which i think was like their test for me to see if i can write like you know, more than two issues back to back of a spider person. So I think, for yeah, I, 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 not to interrupt you, but um, like, I again, I bring up the irregularity of it, which is to say like yeah. amazing Spider-Man is normally not a tryout book. 
Y- yeah. y- you know what I mean? So like, yeah. it's cool that you were really there. And I th- I like your issues a lot, but, mm. uh, but I, but I was, I, I just find it very curious, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I can, I, the, the ego in me wanted to be like, um, Zeb probably had like a lot of sway cause he's going to be taking over Spider-Man and like totally he's worked with Nick for a while. And I think they enjoyed enough of my one shots with miles and the, or my backups with miles and my one shot with, um, with um, Heroes Reborn, and I, I really think a lot of it just went to Zeb vouching for me, and um, and um, and and then like I think this is sort of like not on, not on like TV where like I think a lot of people think that to be a TV writer you have to have like the best script or the best writer, but really there are like sort of three piles that that are like, like the, that a showrunner looks at. It's like here's the best thing I've ever read in my life, or like you should be running this room. Here's the worst thing ever written. It's like you should never touch that script ever again. And the third power, which is like, oh, this is good. And like I can see their point of view, which is where an overwhelming majority of writers land. Is like, oh, they're competent. They can do the job. And I can see their point of view. And they can be massaged and get to the place they want to get. So I think for me, it was like, oh, this guy can obviously write for a serialized show. Like he came from the most serialized um, studio on the planet uh, at the yeah. time anyway. Um, he has a quality like – he we at the at the time like i was the guy that brought daredevil back into mcu proper like he wasn't um he hadn't been he hadn't been shot for um what was it homecoming was that the or far from home uh like, yeah he you know he was in um uh, uh no, no way no home. way home no home yeah yeah um so like originally that was going that was supposed to be she hulk and then they like, hey, let's get daredevil back in there but so like i think there's a lot of trust from like that and again a lot of it, I think, was like Zeb vouching for me, like, "Hey, um, I'm going to take a risk on this guy. I think he's really good, and I think they enjoyed my scripts enough to sort of warrant that." Um, and then also, like, I was very adamant, like, "Hey, look, I want to write Spider People. Like, I don't, I love, <laughs> I love Captain America. I love Iron Man. I love, I love Thor and Hulk. But like, if they're not doing jokes, like, I don't want to write the book just because that's my point of view. And also, like, you know, I was a, I was a comedy guy, like." You know, it was me and Zeb, like the two comedy guys, as far as like we made our living writing comedy professionally on TV. So I think that also went went a long way for 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 me getting on that book. Well, I got to say, hats off for the boldness of everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't get anyone in trouble. But again, I guess maybe I'm cursed by working for TV. I, like I. I don't have to be as uh, uh, on my, my, my toes when it comes to... Oh, I, I, I don't mean boldness in, in terms of reveal. I mean, like, that you were like, I'm going to go play in the big leagues. Like, oh, I'm yeah. going to I'm gonna write Amazing Spider-Man, and I'm going to, you know, like, it's, it, it, it is a big spotlight to throw on, like, a new writer. And, and Yeah, I mean, um, I, look, yeah. I think a lot, also, like, at the time, I was I had just started Rick and Morty, so I was like, I mean, this, jo- this that is not an easy job to work on. So I was like, no, I'm sure if, not. I can sur- if I can survive this, I can s- surely survive you know, Spider-Man and luckily I survived both. So I think that was also very few people can survive Spider-Man Twitter. or (laughs) Yeah. 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 But um, yeah, I lucked out. um, So, you know, uh, but before we move on to like uh, your uh, kind of like miles stuff, I am curious, you know, uh, uh, about like the research that goes into writing, like something like amazing Spider-Man, because like there's a bunch of different camps, you know, that that you, you can get fall into, which is to say like you can, be obsessively obsessively slavish to the continuity or mm-hmm. you can kind of write you know a, a kind of i don't know if i would say evergreen tale um yeah. but you you know you can you you can leverage the continuity f- to tell better stories and mm-hmm. you worked with two characters or two villains and uh, not to mention Ben Riley who's background yeah. is about as convoluted as they come. Um, <laughs> the the fact that Marvel made a 19 part series that took over amazing Spider-Man around a character that difficult to understand the backstory of mm-hmm. is amazing to me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, I, and again, I'm a fan of the beyond run. So, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, but I thought it was very refreshing, but um, you know, you tackled like Craven and um, Otto and, uh, it's funny that, you know, uh, you mentioned like the kind of like slack room. And, and again, this is not meant as like a knock or anything, but um, your Craven, like Craven had recently been rebooted completely, like in mm. the previous run to be like a cl- weird clone. It was like this whole thing. Yeah. Um, and Zeb brought that back in his run recently and did mm-hmm. something really, really interested in it. But your story with Craven doesn't 
like bring it up at all. And I'm wondering if that was like a choice on your part to just like not wade into that territory as, as a writer or, you, you know, if, if that's something you guys were like, let's not focus on that or cause at the time it felt like, uh, reading your story, I was like, Oh, are we just get going back to regular Craven? Um, yeah. which, you know, frankly is like, uh, you know, might be refreshing cause the clone <laughs> thing is weird. Um, yeah. but now we're back to him being a clone again. And so I'm kind of curious, you know, obviously I imagine you're reading the Zeb stuff now, and you've yeah. and you've read that like he's very much like trying to live up to his father's legacy, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, uh, tell me about this because like uh, I, I'm just kind of curious about like the craven of it all. Yeah, um, truth. I did, yeah, I didn't put much thought into it. I was like, one, like I write stuff that I think I would want to read, and I'm like, if I'm coming, that's why I think the perspective of like actually this is something that Nick really that said offhandedly when I first got to writing comics, and I think it may be one of the most useful pieces of like writing sequential story for like one of the big two is that like no matter how well established this character is or this book is or how much it sells every month this is going to be someone's first comic book ever this is going to be someone's first time read like they know who spider-man is but they have no clue or do they really care honestly between peter parker spider-man miles morales spider-man ben riley spider-man kane um and so like or they don't know who craven is like they're like they could they'll google it and they'll look at wikipedia russian hunter hate spider-man okay like so i was like okay that that seems good to me and also i was like i got 40 pages two issues i was like it's gonna suck up so much time i've had to explain he's actually it's a clone versus a clone but he he wants to be like it was, like, it was for me it was like um i didn't think that much about it but in the back of my mind i was like it's too much runway to like explain i always thought about that um scene in looper where like he's like if I have to explain, if I explain time travel, like your head's yes. going to burst. And I'm like, if I have to explain the intricacies of like one clones, how they work within Marvel and like who the Jackal is and what his whole deal is. I was like, it, that, that could be 19 issues of just unpacking how clones work. So like my thing was that like, this is going to be someone's first time reading this character. Like here are the major beats of what you would probably read in like a general Craven story. Like it's not unlike, um, like getting onto a show that has been going on for a while. So like you have an archetype, like we know what Rick kind of does in a situation. Sure. We know what Morty kind of does in a situation or, or, or Hermes or, or Fry or Bender, whoever the character is. And like, that's sort of my approach for that is that like two story, like two issues get in and out. Um, like I'm only going to be here for five issues total counting Doc Ock and, and, and the one shot I was like, I'm not the guy. Cody Zook was not going to be the guy that cracks open the, the pathos of, of of the Craven clone in in his in his first um, soiree into um, Amazing Spider-Man. And also, none of it was just like I was so f- nervous. I was like, "Yeah, this is my this is my big shot." Like um, doing a lot of story circle stuff. Like I was just like, "All like." I'm, I'm sure people know who that is, but like what that is, but like just like really going over, like making sure like structurally, like it made sense and like, sure. Do the beats make sense? So I was, I was thinking like, if I f- up this, like I, I've seen Dan Slott get death threats for writing an issue that someone doesn't like. It's like, am I going to be the guy that gets f-ing literally like death threats because I f- up Craven? So like, or, or whatever my story was. So like that was, that was, that's my long winded answer is saying long winded yeah. way of saying, um, it wasn't my forethought. Like I was, I just wanted to write like a good Spider-Man story. And like, since I was only, since I was basically just like a day player, like it's not for me to tackle or have to worry about that. Like I can let Zeb tackle cause I knew that he was going to be doing bigger stuff with his run. And also like, I was too scared of, to even think about <laughs> talking about the clone stuff. Cause I was just focused on writing, um, two structurally sound, um, Spider-Man comics. Thanks for answering that honestly. I, like, I, yeah. I, I, I'm uncomfortable to ask it because, like, uh, I, I, we our podcast and you know, we review and criticize these yeah. issues. And reading the issue, I was like, you know, kind of bummed that like yeah. we didn't address that. But like, I'm also not aware of the rea- like all of the realities of what's going on behind the scenes and what anyone is trying to value in the 20 x pages that you have. You know, so yeah. Also, like, I, I like my to day peel job was. Back. For- what? Yeah, no, I, I also like my day job. Like, also, I was writing for a full TV show at that yeah, time. Yeah, totally. Um, I actually remember that point of time. I I was writing it around like May, June, July of whatever, whatever. I think I I, wrote, I think we write. I think I wrote like six months before it came out. So like whatever time period that was. But like, I remember I was writing those two issues, trying not to like lose my mind. Writing my episode of 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 Rick and Morty and like that was my first time writing for them so I like, losing my mind over that 
and I was like taking a, a like a, a feature writing class. Like I was, there was a point of time where like there was like a like a five to seven day period where I was like, I would finish writing Rick and Morty, I'd open up and start writing Spider Man, and then I'd start writing a feature film. And I remember just like feeling what? genuinely like genuinely like insane, like a crazy person to be like. I don't know what is happening. All three of these things are going to be absolutely atrocious. No one's ever going to hire me again. But like, um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but like, that's the first thing that popped in my mind is I like context for like what's going on at the time that you're. Uh, I, that's you're all I'm interested in is the context, yeah. you know, because like you know, uh, you know, there is this whole idea of like death of the author, right? Like something is created, yeah. but like I, I, I really want to know what's going on with the author, you know, because there are yeah. the people that are crafting stories that I uh, love uh, as much as much as I do. Um, so uh, let, let's move on to Miles. I, I'll just yeah. say it outright. I love your Miles Morales book. I know, <laughs> oh, like, this is an interview. I thought, I thought this was going to go the other way, but, like, this is fucking shit. Yeah, this is terrible. No, no, no. <laughs> I, like, I, th- this is an interview I know, and, like, normally I don't, like, let my guard down, but I, I, I yeah. honestly think it's, like, so far the definitive Miles run. Oh, my God. And, thank you. And I, I'm really enjoying it, um, and I can't wait to see what you're, you're going to do with it next. Um, but uh, I'm curious, you know, like, how did that come about that you, you know, you've kind of hinted around like, you know, how you got the Miles book, but like, what, what was that like? What kind of things did you have to put together to pitch something like that and yeah. to be the guy that took over after like one, an industry legend, Brian Michael Bendis, then like yeah. Saladin, who's like an Eisner yeah. award winning guy. Yeah. And then it's like Cody Ziegler. He's done a couple issues of amazing <laughs> Spider-Man, you know? Yeah. Uh, I remember getting the, getting the, um, email and being like feeling like a pit in my stomach for him. I was like, F- this is like a dream. Like I don't have it right. I just moved into a new place and my stuff's not together. But for, um, I have the first, the first, they, they did like a combined issue of the first three issues of miles when it, when it first came out, like issue one, two and three. And I remember I bought that at that point, I guess 12, 13 years ago. And I've had it bagged and boarded and I keep it. I've kept it in every office I've worked in. So like my film school, when I was in film school, like, in my desk, I had it there. When I moved to LA, I had it there, and like I had it, um, I had it literally behind me. And I remember like getting that email, being like, "Fuck, this is this is like the dream. Like this is yeah. everything I've ever wanted to do." And now, like, um, you have to like do it. And um, <laughs> Zeb has this. Zeb has this great thing he always says. It's about working in the creative industry, where like the first time you get the call that you're like working for she hulk or you're writing the deadpool or you're doing whatever like it's like the the it's so good and you get 15 minutes to enjoy that and after that you're like Fuck, i have to like do this and like that's exactly how i felt I was like man i have to like write yeah. miles like i gotta come correct and like i remember um i was just like nervous i said yes immediately but i was like so nervous so so what was that to- process like yeah yeah i mean uh like a lot of like first of all i call my parents like yeah, i'm gonna do this and then like talking to Zeb, just like, hey, man, how do you crack, like, an ongoing? Like, I've done five issues, and, like, he, uh, I, I know how to tell, like, a five-act story, but, like, how do you have to tell a story that has no end? Um, or, like, if you consider you're running in, like, you know, how do you tell a 140-issue or for solid 42-act story? Like, that's crazy. Um, how do you do that? So, like, Zeb gave me some amazing fantastic advice that i still use this process writing comics today like i still use this process like it's the most helpful thing i've ever heard when it came to like cracking a story and he gave me his, his he said this is what you need to do to write like a first like a, a run like a five issue thing like this is the structure that works for every single comic this is what i do and trust me it's going to work and i follow that and it i think it worked but i talked to zeb and i put together like a pitch talk of like what i wanted to do what my take was like my take was that like First of all, it's hard to follow Saladin because he's a fantastic writer, but also he went so big and he like did the cool shit, like going to multiple universes, fighting future versions of Miles, fighting clones. I was like, I don't know. How, I'm, there's no way that I can touch that right now because I'm such I'm so new to the game of like writing comics. Like, I don't think you'd what, want to. Like, do you want yeah. to out wacky that? Like, that was yeah, pretty, yeah. A pretty also, wild. Also, you don't ride. want yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. And it was so big, and like I think only Saladin could have made that work. Like. I knew that I couldn't do that nor that I wanted to do it. So like my take was like, I want to do like more grounded, more street level. Like I also was very, I think I literally wrote my, my doc. That's like, I want to have a bunch of black people in this book. Like I'm, it's, it's crazy to me that like there is this black Puerto Rican Spider-Man that's like 16, 17. He doesn't hang out with other black superheroes. Cause like if I had spider powers, the first person I'm calling is like Luke Cage or like Misty <laughs> Knight or like, you know, I'm, I'm seeing what's going on. Like, 
So like I, I made a big point about like, yo, this is going to be a big um, theme of like, you know, mentorship and like black, um, black camaraderie, black community and stuff like that. And uh, I want to really like lean into like his like supporting cast because I think Salen did a, I mean, both of them did, but like Salen really, really, I think he f- knocked out of the park when he created Starling. I was like, that's such a goldmine of a character. And like, mm-hmm. it's a shame that she hasn't had much to explore with outside of like Miles stuff. So I was like, I definitely want them to be a part of the life. But also, I one thing I really loved about the Spider-Man Miles Morales video game is that like they gave Miles his like enemies his own age, but also like a woman. Like I, I think she, I guess you could say a woman. I think she's about eighteen. Like she's an adult. Like, like, like I feel like you don't see like um, women like rogues very often. I feel like when it comes to like Spider-Man, like Miles Morales Spider-Man, I was like, I love that. I love also that like she had a connection to. Um, to 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 miles so like my big takeaway was like grounded um um street level stuff and then also introducing like new character like new villains and new supporting cast and like have it sort of be like more family focused like friend and family focused and you know they they liked it um i had um you know you sort of pitch out like what your first like maybe three or four arcs would be um very very loosely like you could see it going from like you know five paragraphs to like three paragraphs to like two sentences be like, maybe we do this. I don't know. <laughs> you know? And, um, for, for You're better, for tweeting worse, tweeting your plots at them. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, maybe he, he slips on a magical banana. I don't know what happens, you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, they, they liked it. And we, 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 we made the first thing we made rabble. We, we introduced some characters. They introduced, they hooked me up with, uh, um, it's, it's sort of simpatico. I had this exact same feeling actually with, um, spider punk is that like the artist, Justin Mason for Spider Punk and Federico Vizantini for for Miles. Like we just get each other so um, truly, and like it got to the point where like now me and my editor Tom were like, yeah, we don't, we we literally don't have notes for you, um, Federico. Outside, I'd be like, hey, one eighty rule, can you put this person on the left instead of the right, like stuff like that. But like, um, I'll be forever just... grateful that you put Federico on drawing a hobgoblin battle. Like, oh, like. <laughs> like I, I I like read that issue and just like chef kissed into the air. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, it was one yeah. of those things where like I learned this from um, Spider Punk is that like me and Justin are like super close now. We're because we work together, but also we have very similar tastes. But like I emailed Federico, being like, "Hey, what what do you like to do? Like, what would you like to draw?" He's like, uh, "Thank you so much. Um, I would like I like he if you look at his style, you get it now." But he's like, "I draw uh, kind of like how animation is animated, where like um, I have a big inspiration is like animated." fight scene so like if you look at his stuff you could be like oh these are like keyframes in like a sequence so like this is like uh, without getting into the minutiae of like how animation is made but like oh i can follow how this would look animated because it seems like you're looking at like animated thing um with with federico he's like i want to draw cool villains like hobgoblin or green goblin and like i like snow so if you can have snow pop up in an issue i was like i got you dude so like (laughs) a lot of it was that and it wasn't even until like you know maybe like halfway through the run, like, you know, maybe issue like 10 or 11, I started figuring out like sort of like what the, what the story is or like what my take on miles is. And like, I always had big inspiration from like things that I watched growing up, which is like a lot of anime and like a lot of manga. So like that sort of getting in and then our, our, my editor started jokingly calling miles shonen men. So like, they mean sort of leaning more into like the anime and manga of it all. And like, now I think we're in a really good place, but um, yeah, three hundred. He he went super saiyan. Can we? Yeah, can we, yeah, just, yeah, can yeah. we just acknowledge that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like it's one of those things where like you know it's like that domino meme where like you know one here and one there. It's like one I watched Dragon Ball Z at ten and like you know the latest yeah. domino is Miles going super saiyan and, and Miles Morales three hundred. But like yeah, I just put together a doc of my thoughts and they seem to enjoy it. And like now we're at the place now where we have a bunch of characters and I'm always thinking to myself, man, I wish I had more issues to like follow this arc or like introduce this character. Like I get, I've gotten, I've gotten a real appreciation as I've sort of gotten along with miles. Um, it's that like the fact that anyone writing more than 15 issues of a thing can like make it work is very impressive to me. Like, um, like the fact that Dan slot has made as many good comics and they make as much sense as they make, knowing what the structure that he has to work in and like knowing how the nature also, I only ship once a week or once a month. So like 
having to do that twice a month, sometimes three times a month is very impressive. And like, I understand while sometimes you like Akira Toriyama who recently passed creator of Dragon Ball, they'd always make fun. They'd always be this running joke that he would forget about characters. I was like, yeah, I get it now. Like, yeah, I completely, you forget about characters because you, you're, you're in this unique space speaking about the process of like creating is that like, it's sort of like that Dr. Manhattan meme where he's like on Mars, he's like it's 1945. I'm watching a thing. It's 1960. I'm doing this. Like that's how it feels with comics is that like, you know, you're writing a piece of, 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 of art that's, that's, that comes out now and has to exist now, exist now, exist now, but then also at some point is going to be collected and like a trade paperback. So it'll make context in when like you're reading a story as is intended all together at once instead of like once a month and waiting 30 days. And also at some point it'll be collected into an omnibus. So like it'll have greater context because you've the, the entire run together. So like I find myself recently in this place where like, man, it's, it's, it's a unique struggle um, for myself writing um, a piece of, of art that, makes sense that has to exist both now in the future in the deep future and also retroactively in the past by having to connect stuff that happened with two writers before me and i'm lucky in that like i only have two writers before me like i only have been this and solid and so like it's not like you know amazing spider-man just been on for 60 70 years you know stan lee was writing you know yeah. amazing spider-man so like it's it's a unique um skill set and something that i've become deeply appreciative of as i've written more miles like uh, I'm starting to write miles 23 now and I'm like the fact and I'm also I'm writing miles 20 so like you get to the point where you're like you're writing things out of sync and they still have to make sense like it's a unique skill set and um, I've become deeply appreciative of of definitely all the artists and, and, and writers and editors particularly the editors um, that are on these like long form projects which do not have an end um, to the story because the story has to go on forever you know well I have two responses to that one uh, in Amazing Spider-Man number one, Stan Lee called Peter Parker Peter Palmer. So, like, <laughs> you know, even the greats can slip yeah. up uh, on something very major. And two, um, like, it's long been held that the longer a Spider-Man run goes on, the worse it gets. Yeah. Even Stan Lee and Steve Dicko couldn't hold it together past 33 issues. Yeah. Like, that run drops off a cliff after that yeah. point. So, you know, like uh, you're in you're in good company if you're worried about that kind of thing. <laughs> good. You know? um, yeah. And I love both Justin and Federico. I actually have uh, if you're watching, uh, uh, if you're a listener and you're watching on video, I have a, 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 a Mason piece right here and a Vincentini piece oh, right here good. from years ago. So, like, I feel like I've like spawned it into an existence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your career uh, uh, jumped out of my imagination, Cody. <laughs> is what I think I'm trying to say here. Oh, I appreciate um, you, you willing it to existence. Yeah, that's it. Um, so uh, I, I'm very curious. Uh, your Miles has such a distinct voice uh, compared mm. to the previous creators. And I, I mean it literally the writing for his dialogue oh. on the page. Um, Thank you. Can you talk about developing that voice and your rationale behind it? Because like I've always thought that Miles never – read different enough from Peter Parker. Like oh, he yeah. always just felt like Bendis was like, well, I'll just write a slightly younger Peter Parker. He'll joke like mm. Peter Parker, but your miles to me is the first one that truly feels like his own unique guy. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, you know, I wish I had a very deep thought answer or a big thesis, but it really is like, I just write how I talk and <laughs> like, I, 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 I write how, um, how I talk with my friends or like how like I, if I go to my group chats, I'm like, yeah, this is the, uh, yeah, this is how we would talk in those interactions. And like, you know, you got to clean it up a little bit, obviously for, for comics, but like, yeah. Um, my thought process was that like, you know, he's a black Puerto Rican kid who's in Brooklyn. Like he probably talks like how me and my friends or my cousins talk, you know? So like, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of it is like, just like flavoring, like, dropping G's off of words or contracting things or like, um, you know, even like my, my girlfriend has a 17 year old daughter and like even the way that she talks with her friends is like, I mean, I've, I sound like a grandpa next to, to them. So I, I, but like, yeah, you know, you know, you've, when you're a, a black person, like you talk differently, like, you know, without even getting like coach, coach switching all that stuff. But yeah, you know, miles is like a young kid in like New York, Brooklyn of all places. Like he, that's how he should talk to me anyway. And like, um, I just channeled that. So it was like very easy one to one. And like, you know, obviously I have a different sense of humor than, than Saladin or Bendis. So like that 
informed it as well and also like you know i am like a comedy guy so like when it comes to structuring jokes like i think of things that way too but like a lot of it's just like he miles just talks how i how i talk like and, and how, uh, yeah and i i talk, i, I you know? think that's wonderful i'm, I'm so mm-hmm. glad that you've brought it to the book because it really has brought such a distinct uh uniqueness to miles like oh and thank a, you and a time and place uh, mm-hmm. For the character that, uh, you know, I think was always Bendis's intention, right? He was like, mm-hmm. if we were to invent Spider-Man today, he'd be a, you know, a kid from Brooklyn. And yeah. then, you know, no, this is no knock on Bendis, but I don't know that it read like a kid from Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And and yours, yours does, you know, like oh, not that you. I'm like completely savvy on what's going on with like teenagers in Brooklyn, but you know, uh, yeah. I just use the word savvy. So like, uh, but, um, a- a- anyway, um, you know, I guess I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about how you as a writer, um, like judge that and create that for yourself. You know, like if you're writing it on the page, you know, are, are you saying it out loud to yourself to kind of hear oh. it or like, like what's your actual process as a writer for something like that? Yeah, it's very rare for me to say stuff out loud. Like I did that earlier when I was like writing like like TV scripts and stuff to see if jokes land. But like for Miles, like because it's so insular, like it's just me. Like there's no one to really. I mean, my editors and stuff read it, but like it's just me. So like I feel like because now we're at a, wow as a as a culture, like we spend so much time engaging in the actual written word of like text. Like like this may be the most like since the invention of like writing like i think it's maybe the most most amount of time that humans have actually like written like written like literally written things to yeah, each other and like yeah. and because of that like you know because if we spend you know if we're on our phones conservatively like conservatively like five hours a day of those five hours four of them like we're probably texting people or three hours we're probably texting people so like because we, I, we spend so much time or i personally i spend so much time like literally writing like i i just like that it seems so it seems so natural and like There'll be certain things for like characters that are like, you know, like like um um like Hytel or or who's Dominican, like a, a black Dominican woman or like um Rabble who's like Jordanian who are like I'll talk to my friends who are like my friend Sandra, uh she's Arabic, um and like I'll be like, Hey, does this make sense? Like like it feels weird to to me for like uh, a kid to just call their 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 dad father it seems so like structural like it seems so <laughs> yeah so like so stringent like what would she say like oh probably baba like that's what i would do i was like oh yeah then i'll use that or like um like you know i had, I had a bunch of puerto rican and, and, and dominican homies when i was in film school and like they would argue about food who has the better food all this all non-stop and like same thing with like nigerians and, and Ghanaians. like they'll argue over jollof rice so i was like those sort of like things that you see just seems like that should be in that world to make it seem a little bit more lived in, like a little bit more real. Sure. Um, so like if it, if it's something that I'm not feeling that I can necessarily tackle or have the best grip on, like I usually just like hit up a friend and be like, Hey, does this seem real to you? Cause like the last thing I want to do, cause I know this feeling is like you read a book and it seems like, hey, how are you doing fellow kids? Like you want, want to go to the skate park? <laughs> and like, it just <laughs> seems so inauthentic and so corny that like that to me would be like my, my f- death like to me the worst thing would be like writing like a a corny character that's not intentionally corny that like you know reads as like untrue or, or false and like so like I'm, I'm always very cognizant of that so like yeah i, I just i you know I, I i i'm used to writing a lot so like that's how i write and like that's how we speak and i think it, it just happens to translate very well for miles um i it's funny enough like i had someone sort of bring this question up a couple of weeks ago i was like who who is it harder to write for like hobie or miles and i was like it's interesting because you know they're both like young black Spider Men, but like um, Hobie does have like he has a different cadence to me than than Miles. Like he's like a little bit more aggressive. Like he's not afraid to like kill. But like um, Hobie, I think because he's in a world that's so like dystopian, is that um, his his earnestness reads so much more bigger to me than than Miles. Like if you read like Spider Punk, like he's very different from like movie Hobie in that like he's very earnest and like he's very happy with his friends. Like he's very stoked on life because yeah. everything around him f-ing sucks. And like, I think if you took that earnestness and put it into miles, it would read like a little cornier, I think um, just because he's like so gung ho and miles is like, Hey, I like my friend and stuff. But like, I don't know. Uh, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately too. And your question just sort of brought it up to me. I don't think I have a definitive answer. I don't know where I was going with that, but that just popped in my mind as I was rambling on. Well, I, I appreciate its authenticity and uh, it, whatever you're doing, it, it's working. And, um, you know, w- you don't have to answer this, but I, I, I am curious. You know, you worked on that um, 
the like the different like multiverses of miles books and there was the oh yeah the thor book that received a lot of criticism for how it used language um mm-hmm. in, in being like perceived as being stereotyped um in a certain way um mm-hmm. you know it, it, how did, how did that impact you? Like, I guess reading that book or being a part of that team and seeing the book get that kind of, um, you know, criticism. And then d- do you reflect on that when you're writing any of your work, like to, to avoid or, or, you know, maybe you don't even have to consciously think about that, but like, it did seem like, you know, w- whatever it is that you're doing, you know, uh, mm-hmm. is working and, you know, whatever it is that, you know, was in that book, yeah. And I'll leave my feelings out of it. But, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I, f- I feel bad for that dude. Cause I, um, when, so when that book came together, I think it was like five issues. Right. And, um, they were like, Hey, we want you to write two of these issues. Uh, actually they were like, Hey, do you want to write this? I was like, yeah. And I thought I was going to write everything. So I was like, here's my idea. Like, no, actually we're going to have f- four different writers do. I was like, great. And like, they sent two of the writers I was like, Oh, I assume they were all going to be black. Uh, most of them were black. And, um, if you don't uh, comics like it's written at the same time so like you know i had my first issue done but like i didn't even have art done for what hulk or thor looked like until maybe like a week before we were supposed to go off to print so like you know we had outlines or like sometimes outlines sometimes scripts sometimes you just have like treatments like beats of what's going on so like i read the um thor one i was like oh this seems cool like um uh, they were like, I think in the script they were, or in the treatment, they're like, hey, he speaks like, uh, like Thor does. Or like he's, he's like, he said some, some like, uh, some, I don't, and I didn't, I didn't take English in college. It was like, uh, some type of like cadence that he speaks like, all right, whatever. Ye sure oldie black. English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah. all right, cool. Like, I was like, cool. So like when I'm writing my issue, I'm like, I am guess I'm going to write a mix of like traditional Thor comics with like Miles, how, how I think a, a Miles would talk. So like, the way that it impacted me is like one, like I made the misfortune of um, of making a having a joke, you know, that Thor has like you know, by Odin's eye or Bo- Odin's beard, beard or whatever. It's so like I made the mistake of putting by Odin's fave, which I thought was very funny, and uh, it was very fun seeing the context of like I um, back when I had social media or Twitter, like I sent a picture of that out, like this is so goofy, and like although we, there's a bunch of people like treating it, like oh this is so funny, so goofy by Odin's fave, what a funny thing. And then when the actual issue, that issue came out, the Thor Miles issue came out and like people were like, what is this book? And then I, I, I sort of see people would take um, steals from that book and then that, that steal from my issue and be like, this is absolute heart garbage. garbage. I'm like, man, I'm catching a shrapnel. I was like, a month ago, you guys <laughs> yeah, love yeah, this. Yeah. And also it made me realize that, you know, this, this is some comforting for me is that like, you know, you know, as much as people talk about, you know, things that they don't like in comics or like you can very easily see this reaction of like this is garbage can you believe they're doing this to peter or miles of Gwyn? like those people also most of those people retweeting it or commenting in it don't actively read comics because absolutely you know, it's like because i'm like oh this is from an issue that isn't even released yet and like um so like obviously this is like a very reactionary thing and also you'd see people that had shared the image that i posted like weeks ago I mean, it's so funny now being like this is actually heart garbage so like that added some context mm. for me as far as like not taking that stuff seriously but um you know i i felt bad for the guy like you know it, it, i think it i think it's one of those things for me my my point of view is that like this would have really helped to have had like a black editor on this um, totally. one like if also because um we didn't have character designs like i said all done so like if i would have seen that you know um um you know, Odin was bald. I would not have written that he had a fade. And I think if you had, you know, <laughs> I, I never you know, put that together. That's hysterical. Yeah, yeah. You, I would, and also, if you had like a black editor who knew what a fade was, you would have given. You may have given me the note, being like, "Hey, um, in this version, Odin is bald. So, like, let's this joke doesn't really make sense." Or like, I'm going to start know. telling everybody I have a, like a very serious fade. It's, yeah, it, it, it's been yeah. fading for twenty years. Is yeah, what I'll, I'll tell people. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, just, I feel, I felt, I felt. Ultimately, I mean, you know, you got to the art that gets out. It, it's how it gets out. But like, I think it would have helped to have had some people from the culture be like, hey, for that are like in the office editing, be like, hey, this may read is very problematic. Like, we may save you from getting destroyed online um, if this comes out. Um, and like, so for me, I was like, yeah, I got it. I got like a, a treatment one day, like this is things that are going to happen. And then like you read the actual script, you're like, oh, maybe someone should have taken you aside and like, this may not read the way that you want to read. Um, do, do you feel the same way as like uh, the, the Kamala stuff? 
What was the Kamala? Th- her dying? Well, like her dying? Yeah. A lot of people oh. were kind of like, oh, like she finally gets a spotlight only for her oh, to yeah. like get axed. You know? Well, no, because I had because I knew it was going to happen. Like I knew that yeah. she was only going to be dead for like a month or two before a mom was going to be taking it over. So like with that context, I was like, oh yeah, I was like, yeah, I understand why people are going to be mad because they don't know the machinations of synergy between brands. So like they yeah. don't know that Kevin Feige, you know, just picked a name out of the hat and because. He works with Zeb. You know, Zeb is a whether you know it or not. Like Zeb has very prominent figure at Marvel Studios. Like if there's a movie that's come out in the last three or four years, like he has had his fingers on it in some way, shape, or form sure. in the rewriting phase. Um, the ones that you may have hated, also the ones that you absolutely loved. Like Zeb probably wrote something in it that you remember from that movie. So like, you know, I think at the time Zeb had just been doing rewrites for for the Marvel. So like he knows Amon. Like he has a you know he he's he knows a one-to-one to the person that's going to be writing it. So like I felt bad that he was going to get shit. I felt bad for the people that, you know, were getting dragged defending it. And also, yeah. you know, I also, I know the perspective of someone that like you are, this is your only character and they die like that fucking sucks. And like, you feel righteous anger and like you, you feel justified. So like, um, I think because I had context for what was going to happening in their big, big plans for Marvel, like it helped ease that and not take it, like take it bad because I know what's going to happen. But um, if you, if you're blind to that, yeah, I, I get why you would be mad and you would feel some type of way. Like if, if I was reading miles and miles died, quote unquote died, I would be f-ing pissed. And I didn't, if I didn't have context and then I found out two months later, whoever like Shamik Moore was going to be writing miles. Like, Oh yeah, that may ease the punch a little bit. Yeah. But um, you know, it's one of those things where like you're sort of cursed with knowledge. Like I think when, because I know what's happening, it made it easier. But with, um, I think, the the big takeaway from the Thor stuff is that like I felt bad that he got dragged. Also, I felt bad that I got sort of caught up in it. And um, again, my 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 um, sort of solution to all this stuff is having more black people on the comic side. Like, there's I I think I saw a couple of comments. People like, why didn't the writers track this? Um, and like for a technical reason, just because like those scripts aren't coming in at the same time. Like, you know, all these scripts are written basically at the same time or at the same time. But also like we're not getting paid to rewrite some guy. Like there's just someone that they hired yeah. to, to do this. Like it shouldn't also be our responsibility to like, you know, look through a fine coup to tome, everything that comes out. Um, but you know, that's just my take on it. Oh, well, I, I appreciate you uh, talking yeah. about that. I, I'm curious, you know, writing um, miles, uh, you know, how, how has the success of the spider verse movies changed the trajectory of like writing that character? I know that you've kind of, only been in the character for what about uh almost two years now um yeah. so like you know across the spider verse is you know what about a year old at this point uh mm-hmm. the time of this interview um but like it's got like those films have got to impact you in some way i imagine i mean their miles is a different miles like i mean yeah. even just down to like the the miles in the comics, you know, is not like an artist, you know, so, yeah. so to speak, or that's not a heavily yeah. influenced part of his personality. But like that is, believe it or not, like the miles in those movies is the more well-known character than the one yeah. in the comics. Do you feel mm-hmm. a pull to like draw him closer to that character? Um, no, not really. Um, if anything, I feel more of that for, for Hobie, like, because he was such a breakout from, for the movie, but no, like I think, um, you know, I, I, there's never been any mandate for any type of synergy between the movies or, or the comics and stuff, but, um, I've always been of the mind that like there are miles exist in three different categories to three different types of people. And sometimes there's overlap is like, you know, comic book miles. Most people probably know movie miles. And then after movie miles, most people probably know miles from the, from the video games. So like miles, Spider-Man, miles Morales video game or Spider-Man two, so and like there's obviously a lot of those overlap but like as far as like eyes on screen like if Spider-Man 2 was like the best selling game for PlayStation for that year that means that mm-hmm. millions of, me, millions more people are reading or playing that game than they are reading the comics and like however many millions of people saw Spider-Verse you know that's that's how it is uh, that is to me so like those are also three very distinctive miles and like there's some overlap but like they're three distinct personalities so like that's how I have sort of viewed it like um they're different, different people. Like there's no real, um, interplay other than like stuff that I think is interesting. Like, um, um, like I thought, like I said, I thought 
the Tinkerer was very interesting from Miles Morales Spider Man. Like she was a big influence on Rabble, but mm-hmm. um, there wasn't like a mandate that I had to make this character. It's more like, oh, this is cool. Like I would like to see more of this type of a character um, in this archetype in Miles's world. And like, if there's something that happens, well, actually, I'm sort of lucky in that. Like I don't since I don't do any multiversal stuff. Like I don't really have much influence from the Spider Verse films. Like I feel like that was more like yeah. solid and stuff. But like, if there's something that I think is really cool and interesting, and that I think would work also well in a comic book form like i would definitely take it like from spider verse like we me and jason loved um the combat boots that hobie had um we loved his piercings um and like we wanted to give him a hair a hair redesign so like stuff like that influences but there's never been like a mandate from editorial or or, or anything as i was like what i have we have to sync these guys up um i am curious about uh you know uh i loved rattle uh mm-hmm. i think she's a great villain and yeah, I can definitely see the similarities to the one from the video game, um, which mm-hmm. is also, I thought, a great character. But what I love the most about Rabble is that you brought back the kind of like lottery system that yeah. um, Bendis introduced in like the first issue of Miles Morales. And like, mm-hmm. you know, no discredit to Bendis, he never really touched it ever again. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the whole idea of like, of Miles being at this kind of like elite boarding school is just such a like great territory to explore, which I think you yeah. did wonderfully with that villain. Um, and okay. this kind of sort of being cheated out of a position that miles is like, um, not utilizing. Um, and th- there's a real interesting, like guilty thing there. Like, d- did you have like a list of things that you kind of like wanted to touch back in on? Like I, like one of the other great ones that I like would love to, to see reflected. And this is not to give you an idea or anything, but I just mean generally mm-hmm. is like, Peter had this loving uncle that died passing on a great lesson to him. Miles was caught up in his uncle's death in the same way, but his uncle told him he would become a villain before he Mm -hmm. died. And I don't think Bendis ever really picked that back up again. Did you like do a reread of these comics and like go like, these are the things I want to touch uh, when I approach my run. I reread some of my favorite issues but i was i made a big point of like i don't want to reread this stuff because i know it's going to influence me more than it sure. already has and like i don't and also made one of the things where like i'd be a great idea for this and you may forget that something is touched on and like i rather my editor tell me that they've already done this and me like read it in real time it's just gonna like i knew it was gonna suck out any motivation i had <laughs> um <laughs> but the thing about the so i came into it with like i knew i wanted to do commentary on something as much commentary as you can give in a in a big comic book big two comic book but like yeah, for me, like, I think the lottery system is f-ing weird. Like, it's fucked that, you know, one, the education system is built where, like, totally kids can't get a, an equal education. They have to literally gamble their future on this. Um, and even then, like, you're not guaranteed that once you finish school, you can afford to go to college or you can get into a good school. Like, all that stuff to me, it seems so ghoulish. Um, and it just seemed like the perfect... Um, the perfect end for like a classic, what I perceive to be a classic Spider-Man archetype villain. Um, someone who's been wronged by a spider person outside of their own control. And it just happens that rabble, you know, is a person that is also, you know, has like every, I think every good villain should be the hero in their own eyes. And like her manner <laughs> that she goes about it is very, um, you know, <laughs> very misaligned with morality, but like, yeah, you know, her point, she's not mad. I've, I, I've said like, she's not, mad at miles like she's mad at the system that created her and miles just happens to be the thing that breaks her mind and she has she only hyper focuses on him like right and her like flashback you see that she you know she she cannot she doesn't deal with humans very well outside of her parents so like she hyper focuses on things and her instant is like talking to machines because it's marvel she has a power she can talk to machines and stuff so like the way that she sort of reconciles with like this failure and like not living up to her standards that she these these big um this big um, sort of standard that she thinks her parents have placed on her is that she takes out on miles. And like the truly like f-ed up sad thing is that like her parents would not have cared if she got into a good school. She just wanted her to be happy like that. And she yeah. like, that's all that they wanted. So like by her, like going down this path and like struggling, like, like having this task of wanting to hurt miles and kill miles, like she disappointed her family. And like, she like in the, 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 the 300th issue, you know, you sort of see her start to like, sort of like deal with that and like make, you know, cogn- cognitively recognize that. So, like, I just wanted to tell, like, uh, take a uh, have commentary on that, which I thought was very, you know, it uh, sort of a thing that I think should be 
uh, you know, phased out or like talked about within the confines of comic and Marvel was like totally fine with me doing that. Well, I am dying to see how 300 resolves. Uh, what a cliffhanger uh, <laughs> oh, uh, to, yeah. to leave that fun. book on. I think it's fun. Yeah, it was, it's fun. And, uh, uh, you know, I love that you're playing with real stakes there, uh, you know, with uh, the uh, shift, uh, like yeah. getting getting uh, axed. Um, yeah. But uh, um, I'm curious. Let's move over to Spider-Punk really quickly. Um, mm-hmm. You know, what's the story behind your uh your two runs on spider punk, like where did this come from? Um, you know, it, 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 did it come out of the same kind of thing? Like you were doing successfully with miles and they offered you more, or did you have like some burning take on spider punk that you wanted to get into? Yeah. Well, I mean, when we did the first spider punk, like the editor, Danny was like, he texted me or he messaged me one day. Hey, do you want to do spider punk? Uh, we, um, we have reason to believe that people may enjoy him. He may have a certain <laughs> resurgence of like interest in him. I was like, all right, well, he's obviously in the next Spider Verse movie, so we we made that and like truly like we said this in every single email. Like Justin, um, um, Danny, and our even our colorist Jim. Like we were like, this is the most fun we've ever had making anything. Like the most fun I've had writing. The most fun Jim has had doing color. Which I think if you look at the colors for that book, like it's some of the coolest. Jim takes such big swings that you don't traditionally see in that type of like superhero coloring is I think usually seen in one lane and Jim goes the complete opposite direction. Sure. Same thing with Justin. Like we just had so much fun making the f-ing book. And once spider punk came out, you know, the trade paperback was the best selling thing that year for Marvel hands down. Like it's wow. It, it went through, I think three printings. It was, we, we, it was the biggest thing that sold for Marvel that year. Wow. And congratulations. That, Thank you. And and I think also, you know, because he was such an enormous hit in the movie, we're like, we were, me and Jess would be texting like, when are we, can we do that too? When can we do that too? And he's like, I think because people love him so much and it sold out this much, we can definitely do a number two. So like, we just basically browbeat Danny for weeks and finally he's like, all right, boys, we're coming back for one more ride. Uh, so like, <laughs> you know, that was really it. And um, again, this is so much fun we've had like this one because the stakes are so much lower. We wanted the stakes lower. Like, you know, how do you, top killing the president of the United States. Like we just decided <laughs> to go you know, a little bit more self contained in the neighborhood. So like this one is a lot um we've had a lot of fun as far as like references and like inspiration, like, you know, not spoiling anything. Like it, it we you can see the stuff that me and Justin are into towards it definitely issue three and four and like Do you have so a background fun. in punk rock music? Is that something you've been oh, into in your life? Yeah, yeah. I was in a bunch of shitty punk bands when I was in high school. Oh like, wow. I played guitar. Yeah, I was uh, we were terrible, terrible, terrible bands, but I, you know, I was in the, the scene, as much of a scene you could have in rural North Carolina. Like, listen to punk music, played punk music, still listen to punk music. Um, I made a uh, a Spotify playlist when I was writing the first Spider Punk, and like everything on there was stuff that I was, it was a mix of stuff that I listened to when I was in high school and college and like newer stuff. But like, yeah, that playlist is a pretty good amalgamation of stuff that I was into when I was growing up and stuff that I'm into now. So like. Yeah, how, I, I how'd actually, you get into? I, I was part of the punk scene, believe it or not. Oh, uh, cool! Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm a little bit older than you, and so yeah. like I'm always amazed when younger generations are still into punk. Yeah, um, but, I don't know. Uh, how, I mean, I was like a gateway drug. You know, you, you listen to Blink One Eighty Two, and then okay. you hear like Sum Forty One, and then like you see someone like a Dead Kennedy shirt. You're like, what is this? And like you listen to Dead yeah. Kennedys, and then you start getting into like zines. Like I think Maximum Rock and Roll was still a thing that was around there. It's so, like a lot of zines and like. You start reading like the punk dead book, the the punk books like um, what was the big one? Um, uh, uh, I can't remember. There's like a big like punk autograph autobiographical book that came out that one of my friends read and like we got into. So we got into like the damned and like you know the queers and and Richard Hale and all the all the stuff that people are into now like yeah, social like D and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's before Spotify or like Google. So like, sure. he, he, like you just had to have someone's like cooler older brother to like pass along like his crappy beat up um mix mixtape that he made for you but like yeah like, that was that was like my my favorite band when I was in high school was like Dead Kennedys like I was I listened to Give Me Convenience or Give Me Death like maybe every single day of ninth and 10th cool. grade like that was like my band and um when I got into college I got back into it again so like um yeah just I, like I just fucking loved punk and like the idea of writing like a black spider man that liked punk I was like this is the easiest thing in the world with my you know my my tattoos and piercings and at the time i had like 
wild pink hair and I was wearing like combat boots. So I just like, yeah, this is totally what I was like, Danny, you, you could not ask for an easier thing for me to do than to write, write a book about a Spider-Man that lives in a punk universe. Well, on that note, your approach is very different than the sort of like more punk rock metaphor of Jed McKay's stories. Mm-hmm. Like those mm-hmm. were really like, um, like rising up against like c- corporate, uh, you know, America is represented by Norman Osborn, who's in brains mm-hmm. get splattered all over the ground. And like mm-hmm. it really was operating in this sort of like purely metaphor uh, yeah. uh, kind of thing. Can you talk about like your approach to like like what makes of something a spider punk story? Um, if, if it's not going to be a broad metaphor, um, which is not to denigrate it in any way, it's, it's a different type of storytelling. What do you think yeah. defines a pider, spider punk story? Yeah, well, I will say that Jed actually had a lot of DNA was taken from Jed, particularly um, the story where he does um, kill Osborne for the first time. But like the coloring, sure. like the um, that, that sort of energy, like I really resonate with that. Um, I think from my point of view is that like I want to take that, but also not make it seem so like dour. Like I think there should be some joy in this world. And like for me, I was like, I remember being like, you know, one of the few black kids in my super Southern conservative hometown. And like, when you have that like found family, like that's sort of like what brings you peace. And like, you Mm -hmm. can be hard and cold to the world or outside of you. But like when you're with your friends, like I feel like you should let your guard down a little bit. And like part of that was like, I want, I think it would be cool. Like I think Hobie has two, two, two faces as we all have many faces, but like when he's facing down like Craven or Osborne, he has his hard face. He'll, didn't give a shit or whatever, but like he should be excited to be around his friends. And like, I really wanted to build community into it. So that's why he, he, he lit the spider base is like just a Brooklyn community center. Like he does a lot of mutual aid, which like I do a lot of mutual aid, but coincidentally a bunch of like former punk rockers um, out here in LA. So like a lot of it was that, like, I think Jed's thing was like, um, spider, he was called spider man. Like he didn't like being called spider punk. I was like, well, he's, he's, it's not an, like, it's a very, like, it's, it's a for me. It's a one to one culture, like a black thing. Like take something that mm-hmm. you don't like, and then re, re, retake it and recontextualize it, and empower yourself sure. by being called that. So like that to me was like Spider Man, a Spider Punk of it. And I was like, well, what can I talk about? Like, um, like culturally wise, that like they will let me talk about. So I was like, well, I mean, over policing, fascism, like, um, like, like, it, can we just like out and out kill the president? And they're like. Mm, I guess and, and they're like <laughs> the only thing we won't let you do like originally I wanted to have um, all the cops in Washington have the Punisher logo and have Frank Castle be like oh man that would have been so great yeah and they're like we can't we can't we can't do that that's that's oh, we, we have we, we we just absolutely it's not going to be worth us dealing with the headache of doing that so okay but like you know it's a lot of it like if you read the I mean it's, it's very broad like you said but like you know Wilson Fisk he's a capitalist who has taken over a city and he like hoarded all the wealth for himself whether it's medical supplies or like food and like you know the way that they take him down is like someone from that community which is Matea taking him out and like you get to to DC and it's just a police state with like all these like far right conservative neo you know alt right folks that support Osborne with like like saluting his literal statue of him in the Lincoln yeah. Memorial. So like, you know, it's, you know, as close as we good to be like, Hey, we, these are things that we don't support over policing. Like you could have Hulk say Hulk smash all cops. Like you can, like you have to be broad because for me, yeah. like it has to be like a little goofy uh, in order for you to like get that message across. And like that to me is what I found worked with that. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's one of those things where like, you're also writing a book that has to appeal to like people from a large age range like yeah that are, yeah eight-year-olds are reading this because it has bright colors there are people that are like our age reading it people that are older and like you know i would the... not give an eight-year-old jed mckay spider punk books yeah i would not do that as well but funny enough my first comic I ever got when i was around that age was spawn number three my dad bought me spawn number three for some reason uh he obviously hadn't read it and that book is not something that a, a, an eight-year-old should read but um it's one of those things where like how do you how do you have commentary on a social issue which you think is important or uh, a cultural issue that's important that one has to work within the confines of like a spider-man book has to work in the confines of a large corporate entity um and also has to sell and be good at also um reach a bunch of different people that also can maybe gleam away from that message and like that's sort of like where I landed with um with with that first Spider Punk um Battle of the Bands like this seemed like the most fun interesting way for me to talk about this message while while also 
having a fun Spider-Man story. Man, I, I so connect with that found family element, you know, like yeah. even if you watch like classic punk documentaries, like yeah. an- another state of mind or something like yeah. that, where like you see the true bond isn't even really the music. It's like the people you find who are mm-hmm. maybe coming from bad homes and yeah. find a sort of family in the band culture. Yeah. And I really got that out of out of your book as they're in there. Oh, their, thank you. Their spider van driving around the country. Yeah, I mean, also um, that was like some of the fun is like going on like tour, like getting in your friend's yeah. shitty station wagon and going to play a crappy church show was like the coolest thing you could do in that age. And speaking to like the, the community of it all, like, you know, if you you seem like you, you know your punk history as well, but like sure. you know, a large a large section of those punk people growing up were like black and Chicano and like yeah. people of color that was sort of erased from the history of punk rock. So like when I made the book, I was like, yeah, we should the Spider Band should be all people of color. Like that's that just that makes sense with the history of punk rock, and like I think it'd be very cool and powerful for like a young punk person seeing that. So like you know that's why we have like Hobie, and like that's why we we sort of retconned. Um, Captain Anarchy to be like um, indigenous and like so we have Kamala and and we made Matea like uh, a Chicano that's because like those people existed in the punk rock scene and like it would be really powerful I think to see that represented um, in the book that you're reading about punk rock you know I feel like you've had a lot of fun with the, uh, their power sets too in the arms race. Like the even <laughs> yeah. just the latest issue where like they're parachuting in on Miss Marvel and stuff like that is, <laughs> is, is, is a blast. Um, well, Thank anyway, you. so let let's finish off here because you've been really generous with your time, and mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you a question that I ask everybody who comes on the show that's a creator, and um, but I ask you about it with Miles instead of Peter, which is to say, um, given how Miles embodies the idea of anyone can be Spider-Man under the mask in such a distinct way. Uh, what has working on like the first black Latino Spider-Man meant to you personally? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, I mean, it's meant a lot because like that was the first time um, when miles um, was it ultimate Spider-Man or whatever, whenever miles took over Spider-Man proper, that first issue came out. Sure. Ultimate I remember fallout number four. Yeah. I remember I remember I told my roommate, there's going to be a black Spider-Man. He's like, word, let's go. So, like, we we drove to the comic book shop in our – in our we were in Savannah, Georgia. We were both in film school. I remember, like, driving to the comic book shop. They were sold out, but they had, like – it had been out for a while, but they had that um, um, that combined issue, that first one, three issues, and I bought that. I remember, like, looking through Miles and being like, oh, he's like, he looks like my cousins. Like, he looks like me when I was that age. Like, I can just resonate to that. And I was like – is this what it, is this what it always felt like? Is this what like a, a, a like a white kid reading like Spider Man like number twenty five yeah. was like? This because I was like, oh, I get this feeling. This is a very powerful feeling, and um, that's sort of what I wanted to do with Miles. And like still to this day, like the 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 moments that I enjoy the most at like doing cons or signings is when like you know a, a, like a, a young black kid or like a, a Latino kid comes up and they're like, this means a lot to me, and like it, it's cool seeing myself or like. Um, or particularly like I've had kids or parents come up and be like, Hey, um, this is like so-and-so like he is like miles. Like he's, his, his mom's black his his dad's Puerto Rican or whatever the thing is. And like, it's just, it's, it's cool seeing himself on our family represented as like, yeah, that's, that's great. That's exactly what I want. Like I want people to read a book and be like, Oh, this, I see myself, myself in this. Um, that's why like I've made such a point to introduce bigger, more characters, like more villains or whatever. But like, you know, he lives in New York. New York should look, look like New York. Um, you know, I, 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 that, that's just what I want. Like, I want people to read a book and be like, oh, I see myself in the pages of this book because I understand the power of that. So, like, if I have any influence to do that, like, I, I that's what I'm going to do with no, no apologies. Well, thank you so much, Cody. I, I could ask you a hundred more questions, but we're going to leave it there. And um, <laughs> I, I, I thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. All right, it's that time. Time for all good things to come to an end. So we wanted to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers, for tuning into this episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. And an extra special thanks to Cody Ziegler for coming on to talk to me about all of his work with the Spider Office. This podcast exists because of listener support on Patreon. For only $3.99 a month, you can help support our show's existence while getting early episodes, including these reviews the same weeks the comics release, exclusive artwork, and a ton of other bonuses. Thank you to everyone who already supports us and the work that we do. 
Mark and I really want to increase all the awesome work we do in 2024, including more interviews with modern creators just like this one. So if you are already a patron or want to become one, please help us to meet our goals and make this a better podcast by considering supporting our show. Just go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and click on the big Patreon button to get started. So, until Odin starts rocking a fade, our motto will always remain, with great podcasts, there must also come the Amazing Spider Talk. 